Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This is gonna be my Mandalorian episode three video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs, probably one of the best episodes of the season. There's only been three episodes, so it's hard to say. There's not a big sample size, but it's definitely my favorite episode so far. So we'll break it all down, all the Easter eggs. If you're new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes this season. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. We're doing a new Star Wars merch giveaway. Yes, there will be Baby Yoda merch soon. So I'll explain that at the end of the video. Careful for spoilers from the episode, if you haven't seen it yet, obviously, we'll do top 10 WTF and Easter eggs as we go along. Starting with number 10, the title of the episode is The Sin. It's a reference to a couple different storylines during the episode, to the Mandalorian's sin of initially leaving Baby Yoda, this helpless creature, with the Imperials in exchange for this giant fortune in Beskar. It's also a reference to his sin against the code of the Bounty Hunters Guild when he reneges on that agreement to save Baby Yoda later in the episode because now he's the most wanted man in the sector along with Baby Yoda. Think about it this way, if they activated all those tracking bobs at the end of the episode, it's only going to get worse for him through the rest of the season while he's on the run trying to protect Baby Yoda. But right after they come out of hyperspace, Baby Yoda jumps out of his bassinet and grabs the ball on top of what looks like the hyperspace lever that's very similar to the hyperspace lever on the Millennium Falcon, just to play with it, stick it in his mouth. They carry that moment forward when the Mandalorian goes to activate the lever later and sees that the ball is still missing, reminding him of the kid before he goes back to save him, and then again at the end of the episode when they pay it off, when he detaches the ball himself and gives it back to Baby Yoda to play with. Number nine, turning over the kid and collecting his fortune. So the surface of the planet actually looks really harsh. All those red lines give it a very Mustafar feel, like the planet's surface is very, very harsh. Although I'm pretty sure this is not Mustafar. The actual Mustafar planet is way more red overall in color. The look of the kid's face as they're walking through the shipyards and the streets seems like he's never been around so many people and aliens in a city like this before. And he's having this tiny little panic attack while he's just not sure what to make of everything. They pass the same street food vendor cooking salacious crumbs on his spit. You see way more different classic aliens. You see a Twi'lek for the first time that they later reference when they say Twi'lek bathhouses when Grief Karga is telling him, hey, let's go to the spa. It'll be a great time, making it sound like it's more of a brothel than an actual spa. There's an R5 looking droid that's colored similarly to the R5 droid the Jawas tried to sell to Owen and Beru Lars and Luke Skywalker during A New Hope that later comes back at the end of the episode when it's trying to take them to the shipyards before it gets blown up by Grief Karga. Things start to turn the minute he sees how the stormtroopers are treating Baby Yoda, just yanking him around trying to poke him like it's a piece of meat. Even the stormtrooper who yells at him for questioning him sounds exactly like the voice of the Imperial officer during Return of the Jedi that says, you rebel scum. I wouldn't be surprised if they actually did try to sample that voice from the original trilogy because they do that a lot with audio Easter eggs. It is one of the most iconic Imperial lines from that movie that people repeat. As Dr. Pershing and Werner Herzog's characters scan the baby and get really excited, they give him his bounty in Beskar. But when he pulls it out, it's the actual ice cream maker Star Wars Easter egg from Empire Strikes Back. If you didn't spot it or you're relatively new to the original trilogy movies, when they're in Cloud City and things start to go crazy, you see this character running in the background with what looks like a giant ice cream maker as fans dubbed it. People just started calling it the Star Wars ice cream maker. John Favreau brought it back for this series. During Empire Strikes Back, nobody knew what it was for, but on this series, Jon Favreau has turned it into sort of a portable lockbox for valuables. As he starts to question their intentions, things start to get ugly. Werner Herzog's character questions his code, quote unquote, of honor as a bounty hunter. Isn't this against the code of your guild? He also reminds him that most of his people, the other Mandalorians, were killed during the purge, implying that he might join them if he doesn't get out quickly. So number eight, the Mandalorian Enclave, their codes, his new armor, and the signets. Mandalorians have their own code about right and wrong that's way more important to them than any local laws or any of the laws of other organizations like the Bounty Hunters Guild. This is the way is the line of dialogue that they repeat to each other throughout the episode and then again at the end of the episode, this is the way. But he gets his shiny new Beskar armor so everybody kind of hates him because he looks so awesome now. The other Mandalorians are really excited to see what's going on. They're really curious, but also really upset when they see the Imperial Signets on the bars. These bars were stolen during the Purge. He gets the special new Whistling Bird's weapon for his gauntlet. He used a bunch of cool weapons during the episode, but it's just guided Beskar darts that detonate on impact. 
They show you a ton more flashbacks to the Clone Wars around Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. You finally see the larger battle droids in the droid gunship flying overhead, so it's just implying that this was happening during the Clone Wars, and you finally find out why he hates droids so much in present day, because the battle droids killed his parents. But number seven, when the other Mandalorians get pissed at him for working with the Imperials and the idea that they're just reclaiming Beskar that was stolen from them during the Purge, the Mandalorian in the heavy infantryman armor that starts to fight with him is actually voiced by Jon Favreau himself. If you ever watched any of the Clone Wars, you probably remember that Jon Favreau played the pre Vizsla Mandalorian character, one of the most important and powerful Mandalorians around that era. His family descended from the very first Mandalorian to become a Jedi, and that Mandalorian created a Darksaber thousands of years ago. Many years later after he passed away, Pre Vizsla's family stole the Darksaber back from the Jedi Temple and used it as a symbol to rally the Mandalorian clans together after they'd been scattered for years after the Great Sith War with the Jedi. The Darksaber is still around in Star Wars canon. The last time it was seen was on Star Wars Rebels before the events of A New Hope being wielded by Bo-Katan Kryze, one of the last known leaders of the Mandalorian people. But as they imply several times through the series, under Imperial rule, their people were also purged, kind of like the Jedi were during Order 66, and the clans have just scattered to the four corners of the galaxy. But the signet that they offer him for his armor is for the Mudhorn. You're allowed to wear the signet of whatever you defeat in combat on your armor, but he forgoes it per the terms of their codes of honor because Baby Yoda helped him defeat it, which they sort of incorporate with his arc during the episode about saving the kid, turning the kid over, then changing his mind because he says, my enemy helped me defeat it, so I'm not allowed to take credit for the kill. My enemy did not know he was my enemy when he was helping me. He's talking about Baby Yoda at this point is still his enemy because he was part of the bounty, but obviously he changes his mind at the end of the episode per the Mandalorian's code of honor. Number six, all the other bounty hunters of the guild hate him. He almost takes off to the other side of the galaxy just to avoid having to think about what he just did, turning the kid over. When he gave him the bounty for the Mon Calamari, saying it's a nobleman's son who skipped bail, all I could think about was that Admiral Akbar's son has turned into a criminal, but I think this is just some sort of random member of his race, some new character. I believe that Admiral Akbar's son does show up during the new Star Wars trilogy, although Admiral Akbar himself was just killed off in the last movie. So during this show, he's technically still an admiral because this is right after Return of the Jedi in the New Republic's fleet. They also finally reference the actual New Republic, but mostly the Mandalorian saying that it's a joke to think that they would care what the Imperials or the remnants of the Empire are doing this far out on a backwater Outer Rim territory. It's funny to think that people hated the Empire because they were so terrible, but they also kind of hate the New Republic because they think that the government still doesn't care about them, even though it's a completely different group of people. Number five, he decides to rescue Baby Yoda. So he listens in to Werner Herzog and Dr. Pershing talking about the kid after he finds the bassinet in the trash outside the office. Werner Herzog is arguing that he won't be able to protect the doctor much longer and to hurry up and get his sample and be done with it which we later learn is code for kill the kid after you get your sample of his DNA. Like Dr. Pershing says, he'd be dead now if it weren't for me. More on that in a second, because Dr. Pershing survives at the end of the episode, so he's definitely coming back. But watching the Mandalorians mow through the stormtroopers like a Terminator was totally badass. One of my favorite sequences through the episode so far, it's like Darth Vader at the end of Rogue One. You know exactly what's going to happen. He's just going to mow through all those rebels with his lightsaber. Him going around room to room also kind of reminded me of Star Wars Dark Forces, that old first person shooter made in the style of Doom or Wolfenstein 3D. That was such a great game back in the day. In major bonus points for creative use of Grappling Hook, he had a lot of really creative kills during these scenes. He's also been a big fan of his Gauntlet Flamethrower, which he uses to barbecue one of the stormtroopers. I think he's used it in every single episode so far. But number four, Dr. Pershing in the Kid. There's an Imperial interrogation droid in the background, just like the one from Star Wars A New Hope when Darth Vader was interrogating Leia in her cell. And just like that scene, they zoom in on the needle. But you also wonder if he was using this on Baby Yoda somehow. How do you interrogate a baby that can barely speak? Or more likely, it was there in the background and they were using it for other things on other people. Dr. Pershing mistakenly thinks he's there to kill the kid, which lets you know that even though he's working with the Empire on some sinister cloning project, he's not a total monster. He cares about the well-being of the kid, so maybe he will also turn later in the series and actually try to help the Mandalorian protect Baby Yoda. 
but the device that he has him hooked into that's taking samples is probably taking DNA samples for potential future cloning. And the episode ends with them implying that he got all the samples that he needed so this cloning project can move forward and it might wind up becoming something bigger during a future season if they don't shut it down before the season finale. Maybe Dr. Pershing will help out with that, but the only way to stop something like that would be to destroy all the samples or destroy all the research that they generate from those samples. Number three was the scene of them activating all those fobs and the bounty hunters from the guild coming after him again. I love this slow scene of the cantina with the bounty hunters realizing what's happening. Oh, wait a minute. The bounty's back on. The scene of him slowly trying to walk out of town, kind of looking around, noticing that all the other bounty hunters are just waiting to make a move is this great moment of tension. They have their big standoff. Carl Weathers' grief Karga calls him on the code of the bounty hunters guild that he's violated. And just as he's about to go down, all the other Mandalorians jetpack in, raining fire on all of them. So number two, John Favreau's Mandalorian infantryman leads the charge. As pissed off as he was at the Mandalorian for working with the Imperials earlier in the episode, their code is higher than any other local law or the Bounty Hunters Guild, so it doesn't matter that they'll have to move their secret base to another planet for their protection. This is the way. We protect our own, so it doesn't matter what the Mandalorian has done to break the code of the Bounty Hunters Guild or break in any kind of Imperial or local laws, the Mandalorians will rally to help him no matter what. You get a sense for all the different types of technology that they use. Almost all of them, besides the Mando himself, have jetpacks. They sort of pay that off at the end of the episode with the funny moment, I gotta get myself one of these, as John Favreau's Mandalorian jetpacks up alongside his ship, salutes him, and then goes back down to the planet. Even though this was a huge scene, a huge moment of them all coming together and fighting, and it was probably really expensive to film, I'm hoping that we get something even bigger like this later in the season where more Mandalorians rally to help him. Number one WTF, they escape, but Grief Karga survives thanks to the Beskar bars blocking the blaster shot. Nice use of the carbonite freezing device to steam up the cargo hold to get him. But because he and the Imperials are still alive, Werner Herzog's character is still alive, Dr. Pershing is still alive, they have the research and the DNA samples from Baby Yoda, things are only going to get worse through each episode as the Empire tries to get rid of both of them. The bounty on them will probably go up, they'll become more notorious through the sector as other bounty hunters from other planets start to rally to try and take him down. But we're still not even halfway through the season. We still need to meet Gina Carano's bounty hunter character, and we still haven't met Giancarlo Esposito's Imperial Moff character yet. And he's even more powerful, and it seems like he's tied to Werner Herzog's character and Dr. Pershing somehow. As you would expect, he's also playing a very Gus Fring-like character on the show. But let me know if you spotted any big Easter eggs in the episode that I didn't mention in my video. Obviously, my episode 5 video will post next week. I'll do more bonus videos for The Mandalorian during this week, too. So if you have any special requests or big questions you want me to answer, just let me know in the comments. For those of you asking about merch, they did say they would start selling Baby Yoda merch really soon. So the giveaways will probably be something for that stuff once they announce what the actual merch is going to be. But everyone click here for my new Baby Yoda in Jedi History video and click here for my Mandalorian Episode 2 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.